Dr. Shaheen, a PhD, um, is a partner at Lux Capital. Shaheen empowers entrepreneurs aiming to accelerate humanity towards a fantastic future through fits of engineering. His investments, his recent investment at Lux Capital include Nirvana, the deep learning company recently acquired by Intel, uh, Planet Labs, which is launching the world's largest fleet of um, Earth imaging satellites, uh, Plethora, which is rolling out a fleet of robotic machine shops, Flex Logics, making chips that can reprogram themselves, Relativity Space, launching 3D printed rockets, Mythic, bringing powerful deep learning to edge devices, and Zooks, what comes after the automobile. And these are just some of Shaheen's recent investment. And please help me in welcoming Shaheen. Thank you very much. Uh, great to be here. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself and my, my journey, which led me to being where I'm at right now. And uh, my firm, Lux Capital, what we do. And a couple of areas that I find exciting. Um, so. So first, some history on myself. So I, I grew up here in the Bay Area. Um, my dad was a student at Berkeley, and so I grew up in, in Albany, which is a small town near Berkeley. And uh, when he graduated, his first job uh, was in Cleveland. So I went to, to Cleveland, and my mom wasn't too crazy about the snow, so we came back to California. And she became very homesick, wanted to move back to Iran, so we ended up moving to Iran. So I had a little bit of a reverse immigration. I moved to Iran uh, as a teenager, which was interesting. Uh, so I stayed there for a few years, did high school there, did a year of college there, and then I came back. Um, started all over again, went to college, uh, ended up at Berkeley, did ECS at Berkeley. Uh, always had a passion for cars and computers and space, but given the dot-com bubble days, um, I, cause I, I did college in the late 90s, so I decided to do computer engineering uh, and get rich and hopefully buy a car, uh, a nice car. But then unfortunately I graduated in the bust, and so um, it was, how many of you were here during the dot-com bubble kind of crash era? Okay, a lot of you, it was pretty, it was pretty depressing. Uh, it was so depressing, in fact, that I went to Detroit uh, in pursuit <laughs> of greener pastures. So I, I got a job at GM. And so I went to GM and I realized the hard way how, how terrible it is working for a, a big, slow-moving, uh, Midwestern-based company. Uh, so disenchanted uh, at trying my hand at the automotive kind of technology space, I came back to California, did a PhD in electrical engineering. Like many grad students, I decided to start a company around my research. I thought my PhD research was the most interesting, exciting thing in the world. Uh, lo and behold, it was, it was cool technology. Uh, but it was a terrible uh, business idea. So I was making these miniature wireless uh, vital sign monitors to be able to track patients in hospitals. And uh, hospitals loved paying for them, but they didn't want to pay enough so that we'd come out positive. And so, anyway, I learned the hard way that you know, it's really important who your market is, who, who, the, who your customer is, what the market is, you know, what the sales cycle looks like, and what can be the underpinning of a viable business. And I had none of those, unfortunately. Uh, so shortly after that, I was thinking about my next startup, and my friends were saying, hey, you should get to know VCs before you need their money. That's the best time to get to know VCs. You shouldn't pick up the phone, call a VC, or email a VC, and say, hey, would you write me a check? You should say, hey, here's what I can help you with, and build a relationship with them. And they're not used to people actually offering them uh, some type of, of assistance. So I reached out to a bunch of VCs who are not in California, and said, hey, I'm in California back then. Semiconductors were hot. This is like mid-2000s. And I said, hey, I'm a chip guy. Um, I'm in between companies. I'm you know, thinking about my next startup, but would be happy to help you guys find founders and do diligence on chip companies in California. I have a you know, footprint across you know, Northern and Southern California. I went to Berkeley undergrad, UCLA grad school, so I have a lot of contacts you know, up and down the state. And uh, you know, I'll, I'll send you guys deals. And many VCs said, yeah, sure, you know, send us deals. But then Lux Capital, uh, which was a very young fund at the time, uh, said, hey, you know what, we'll give you an email address, we'll give you a business card. I'm like, holy shit, this is amazing. Uh, so I said, absolutely, sure. And so after that, uh, a few months into it, um, they said, hey, you know, we'll actually, we'll, we'll pay you. I said, okay, sure. And I was basically getting a small amount of money every month and going to conferences and shaking people's hands and sending deals their way. Uh, and then fast forward to April 2007, about a year and change into it, um, they closed their first institutional fund. It was a $92.5 million fund. Um, and said, hey, do you want to join us full time? And I said, yeah, sure, you know, I'll try this VC thing out, and here I am 10 years later. Um, so uh, how many of you know what venture capital is? 
Okay. Uh, okay, so about half of you. So, so venture capital is basically an asset class. That's the technical way of thinking about it. But um, in reality, is that it's a, it's a means of funding a young company, a startup company. And the, the biggest, I think, um, uh, um, I think the, the biggest, I think, mis misperception, misconception is that if your company isn't suitable for venture capital, then it's a bad business. I think that's the biggest lie out there. The reality is that the vast majority of great businesses make absolutely no sense for venture capital. You can think about it as a, as a Olympian or as an athlete on steroids. Like, you put someone on steroids, sure, they can lift up a barbell, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be a great lifetime athlete by pumping them with steroids. And so the same applies here. Startups that make sense for venture are startups that, with a modest amount of capital, can inflect many times over. So you put in 10, 15, 20, 50, 100 million dollars, you generate many, many billions of dollars in enterprise value. And that just doesn't apply to the vast majority of great businesses out there. It only applies to a small fraction uh, of types of companies depending on the nature of the market they're selling into, the nature of the customers that they're going after, the nature of their technologies. So many, let's say, locally, you know, local oriented companies, um, you know, companies focused on small communities don't scale the way a venture-backed company would. Many companies that are selling into, say, the healthcare supply chain probably don't um, uh, make sense for venture capital. A lot of companies that are making, that are offering services don't make sense for venture capital. And I'm sure many of you in this audience can build great companies, not raise a dime from venture capital, and become very rich and successful. So um, venture, again, is a method of financing companies that fall under the very, very small category of being able to inflect largely with a modest amount of capital. Um, and I can talk about a few examples uh, later. So, so typically, um, so the way VCs work is that they raise money from large institutions, so endowments, foundations, trusts, well not trusts, but endowments, foundations, uh, public offices, uh, public, sorry, public um, uh, family offices, uh, you know, universities, and the goal, um, these institutions, their goal is to put their money um, in different asset classes. So they invest in public securities, they invest in uh, uh, real estate, they invest, in, they invest in natural resources, they invest in bonds. Um, a small portion of what they, of their, of their asset allocation goes into private equity. And then a small portion of private equity, which is privately held securities, goes into venture capital. So um, you're talking about single digit percentages of their overall assets under management go into the venture capital asset class. And they expect that tiny, tiny piece to generate massive, massive returns. Uh, for them, so they expect double-digit percentages uh, of of IRR um, for that um, uh, little piece that they invest, because they can get eight to ten percent in the public markets and three or four percent with, you know, bonds and these other asset classes. They look for that large return, which is why VCs are very much focused on investing in these companies that can inflect um, in a massive way. And so we invest that money over the course of a typically a, a ten-year life cycle. So first five years is spent investing the money and the next second five years is spent harvesting those investments and we invest and we raise funds in multiple uh, uh, vintages so right now Lux is investing out of his fifth fund our first fund was a very small fund that was basically one guy's money uh, back in the two, early 2000s our, our second fund uh, was the fund where I joined the 92 and a half million dollar fund which was closed in 2007 we closed another one in 2011, another one in 2014, um, and well, 2015, and the current fund we just closed earlier this year. Any high-level questions on venture before I get into it? Makes sense to everybody? Question in the back? Yeah. What is your deal with your investor? You oh, that's a good question. Okay, so what is our deal with our investors? So the way it goes is that we make the final call um, as to where we invest the money that they've committed. Um, and then they get a share uh, in the returns. So for every uh, dollar that we generate in returns for the investor, uh, they take 80 cents and we take 20 cents. So if we raise, for example, a, so our current fund is a $400 million fund. If we double that, then we take 80% of the 400 million, oh, they, sorry, we return, the, okay, so first we give the $400 million back, 
obviously the original 400 million, that, that goes back in its entirety. And then of the remaining $400 million that we've returned, uh, that we've generated, uh, $320 million goes to the, uh, to the investors, and, and, and that remainder, $80 million, uh, goes to us, the managers. Question in the front. Yeah, um, you probably forgot, you know, you know already, the LP the concept. You didn't mention the LP concept. Yeah. Rule yeah. So the foundations, the, so the technical term for the foundations, endowments, family offices, high net worth individuals, uh, uh, corporations, the people who put up the money, are the quote unquote limited partner, for the reason being that they don't make the investment decisions, but they have a share in the profits because they're putting up the money. Question. Okay, so uh, this is getting complicated. So hedge funds, this is a tough audience. So hedge funds typically invest in public securities. And the word hedge comes from the notion that they are market neutral, meaning that they invest long, meaning that they invest in the expectation or the anticipation of the markets going or the value of that security going up. And they go short with the expectation of a security going down. So that's how they hedge. So the biggest difference is that in venture capital, we're only going long. We're only going in one direction. Um, if we, we do not bet on companies going down. We have no hedge, basically. We have no, we have no safety net uh, the way the hedge fund managers do. And although some hedge funds do uh, private investments, they typically focus on uh, public security so they can do the hedging is very, I mean, it's almost impossible. Well, I don't know for a fact, but then as far as I know, there is no, you know, tried and true known way to, to, to short um, a private uh, security because private shares and companies are typically not liquid. Uh, whereas with hedge funds, when you're doing public securities, you're, you can, you can, at least these securities are liquid, so you can go long and you can go short and hedge against each other. Does that answer your question? But, but the hedge funds do have the same structure. They do have a limited partner, general partner structure where the limited partners put up the money and they take a fee and they take the percent, the carried interest, 20%. That structure is very similar to venture capital. Good questions. What's the risk for venture capitalists if the business fails? The risk is infinite. So the risk is all, well not infinite, sorry. I don't want to say this on record. The risk is the amount of money that they put into the company. So all the money that they put into the company is at risk. So their risk is limited to the entire amount. So as a, as a limited partner, all of your money is at risk. You're in, all of your money can turn into a zero. And that's what you do. That's why these large institutions who commit to venture capital only put a small amount of their assets into venture capital. And they put the majority of it into public securities, real estate, you know, hedge funds, these other kind of less, less risky um, asset classes. But then in return, they expect greater performance for that greater risk that they're taking. Question? And the risk of the venture capital is the time and brand, right? Uh, the risk in? The venture capitalists that they, they, they basically uh, invest on the money of limited yeah. partners. The, the risk is, is basically their brand and their time if there's that kind of. Yeah, if so you know. so for, for the managers, for us, first of all, we put up some of the fund ourselves, oh, so okay. we have skin in the game too. Is that? have to or it's it's typically the case oh, I, I mean there are, I guess there are some out there I don't know of any but there are some that probably could get away with it mm -hmm. but um, but normally um, uh, the managers also put up the money themselves so we also have money at risk um, and, uh, and yes it's also the, the, the reputation of the firm um, that's at risk although the expectation is that you under that's why most VC firms are formed as partnerships so partnerships have a process for making investments and typically, if that process is well documented, deal memos are drafted, and there is a relationship, there is there's board representation, if proper governance and oversight takes place and an investment goes to zero, then the reputation of the firm is, is protected. You can have a company do very well and the reputation of the firm not be so good because of the way by which they made the investment, the lack of governance, so it can go either way. Question? Is there a percentage, a success percentage that is considered uh, like a successful venture capital? So the expectation for the asset class is to generate three to five times 
uh, I would say two to five times uh, a multiple on that on that invested capital. And if you do the math on that, two to five times puts you uh, in the kind of IRR range over ten years of you know low to kind of you know midish, like might say ten to twenty five percent. IRR. And then if you do the math, if you do anything less than that, if you're doing 10%, then like, why is it the endowment putting their money in the public markets? Why are they locking themselves up for 10 years and taking all this risk for, you know, for the same return that they would get by investing in an index fund, for example, you know? So I would uh, be mindful of that. So when, 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 BC, when entrepreneurs come to me and say, hey man, like invest in my company, I can, I can double, you know, your investment. I'm like, thanks, but no thanks. Because, like we, every investment we make is with the expectation of returning something of the order of the fund. Because if you do the math, the, the reality is that the majority of the investments will not return capital. That's just statistics. So if you make bets with hopes of maybe doubling your money, then you're setting yourself up for failure. You have to make investments with the expectation that every single investment will return ten times your money. So if the math works in your favor and you have a couple of good outcomes, if a couple of those investments actually do get there, then you can return a couple times your fund. If a, if a couple of them generate 10 times and the remainder of them not do that. Does that make sense to everyone, by the way? So don't go to a VC and say, hey, I'll double your money. They're gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna show you the door, all right? Okay, so, so um, to tell you a little bit about what we do at Lux, um, the vast majority of VCs in the Valley focus on, on the left. They focus on companies that are doing social, local, mobile, kind of find a date, find a parking spot, rent your couch, you know, rent a car, get your meals delivered. Those kinds of businesses do have that network effect kind of viral growth aspect to them that makes them very conducive to venture capital. You know, you throw some money into Facebook ads, you know, you, you do something special and unique, you grow your company very quickly, you, you, know, you do growth hacking, quote unquote, still don't know what that is. But anyway, you're, you're able to generate a, a massive company with, with a modest amount of venture capital investment. And the majority of the companies out there, the majority of the VCs out there focus on that. And when they evaluate these companies, they look for very well-defined metrics. How many users do you have? How many of your users come back next week? How many of them come back every month? How many of them click on these things? Uh, what's, your LT, what's your LTV? What's your CAC, your customer acquisition cost? What's your LTV over CAC? What's your CAC over LTV? What's your MRR daily? Like there's all these, uh, metrics that they use to measure you and different VCs have different thresholds when they when you hit some threshold an alarm goes off and they make an offer uh, to lead your series A um, or to seed your company so we are not one of those firms we focus more on the right which is high impact technology investing we like to say that we invest where capital is scarce and barriers are high and typically those barriers are technology uh, related barriers and I'll tell you more about um, uh, what areas that I like um, in a second. So, so this is Lux Capital. When I joined back in 2007, I'm the, the guy in the back. So we're a bunch of young guys. Um, you know, we, we took ourselves seriously. We wore suits. Uh, we hung around. With, we hung out with old guys to like you know to look more sophisticated. And uh, you know, we were doing a lot of work in the materials and nano space, um, nanotechnology space. And since then, we've taken the suits off, and you know, we take ourselves less seriously. We've grown the team, um, and we're doing a lot of uh, more interesting things in AI and computer vision. Uh, we're doing a lot of manufacturing automation, uh, robotics space, um, and so you know, just to give you a couple of examples, um, you know, we invested in Planet Labs, uh, which is launching a constellation of Earth observing satellites. I'll tell you more about them later. We invested in Zooks, driverless cars. I'll tell you that. I'll tell you about that more too. Um, we invested in a company that's a, that was founded by a Nobel laureate that's investigating the connection between our brains and our guts um, and trying to find um, a medication that would address neurodegenerative disease through that. Uh, we invested in Nirvana and that picture is a chip from, uh, that was just, um, uh, just announced a couple weeks ago where it, Nirvana's technology went into an Intel chip. Um, I did a rocket company, they're doing 3D printing for rockets. On the bottom left, you'll see a, um, a really interesting technology that is able to overlay any kind of vehicle on a rolling chassis. So imagine producing a, an advertisement for a car and having just one car uh, be a variety of cars in production. So when you're, when you're filming it, you film one 
that, that little slice in the middle, you'll see the actual car, which was basically a rolling skeleton, and be able to put any body on it that you'd like uh, for future incarnations of a, to say, for example, a commercial. And so basically what this company is doing is bringing post-production and production together. Right now, post-production is a very manual process, and they're doing this entirely in software. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about three areas that I'm really excited about. One is driverless cars, uh, the second is space, and the third is, is the brain. So first of all, driverless cars. It's really amazing how quickly over the past three or four years, driverless cars has gone from science fiction to a to the zeitgeist, pretty much. And pretty much, you know, anyone who could have anything to do with driverless cars is getting on the bandwagon. And you've had a handful of startups raise an ungodly amount of money, um, and some of them get acquired very recently. So all the automotive manufacturers, all the ride-sharing companies, all the you know a lot of semiconductor companies, the consumer electronics companies, um, are all getting into this game uh, with the expectation. Um, of riches at the end. And, and why is that? Well, first of all, um, the hardware has come a very long way over the past 10 years. So um, all of the hardware pieces that are required for an autonomous car to be able to see its surroundings are almost dirt cheap right now. So radar, which cost thousands of dollars uh, 15 years ago, is now $100. Um, uh, acoustic sensors, cameras, all of these have become completely commoditized. And so you can build the eyes and ears of a car for less than $1,000 of, of a driverless car for something on the order of $1,000 now, except for the LiDAR. And LiDAR is what gives you a 3D picture of the world. And there's now probably 50 companies, and we're investors in one of them, um, that are trying to reduce the cost of a LiDAR device. Um, and so I'm very confident that the cost of all of these devices um, are going to make it very cheap and easy uh, to, to build a driverless car. So that's the hardware, and the software has advanced dramatically. This picture, believe it or not, is from 2011. And this is the intersection, this is an intersection in, um, near down, this is Castro, um, and, and the uh, Central Expressway in Mountain View. So it's a very complicated uh, intersection. You'll see a base map that they've had a priori, and they've centered the car, they've localized the car on this map, it's the red Prius that you see at the intersection. And they're able to pick up uh, all of the cars and the pedestrians and the light posts and they can read the traffic signals and this is from six years ago and so imagine how much it's improved uh, since then and so a lot of this is attributed to many open source um, tools that are available now um, and a lot of work that's gone into this a lot of labeling that's been done a lot of that data uh, being available broadly so now you're seeing scores of companies companies like comma.ai, drive.ai, too simple, autox trying to build the brains, uh, the software, uh, for these autonomous cars. And so how does this all come together? Different people have different opinions on this. And my opinion is that in order to really enable the driverless car, the vision of a driverless car, uh, when I say driverless car, I don't mean like autopilot where you can take your eyes off the road. I mean a car with no steering wheel. And to realize that, you have to reinvent the car from scratch. And the analogy that I like to use um, is the uh, is the dawn of the automobile itself. How many of you guys remember in the mid 1850s when you read about the history of the car? The cars basically looked like carriages with no horses on them, and these were coach built coaches, effectively, that tinkers would attach motors to, and would call them cars, call them automobiles. And the original Oldsmobile curved dash was one of those. The original Daimler was one of those. And these cars were great for rich people and. Um, you know, novelties at the time. And it wasn't until Henry Ford partnered up with the uh, Dodge brothers, and by the way, Henry Ford tried to start car companies twice and failed. This was his third attempt. So if you were an investor in Henry's second company and chose not to fund him the third time, you would have been an idiot. And so, which is why we'd like to back entrepreneurs even if they, um, you know, miss the first time or second time. So Henry Ford, third time around, partnered up with the Dodge brothers, and together they came up with this new vehicle architecture which survives to this day. And so it was rethinking the automobile from scratch, which made the concept of the automobile uh, practical and mainstream. And so if you look throughout the, the decades, the automobile has pretty much stayed the same. Um, and so, the ex so my hypothesis is that to really realize a driverless car, you have to reinvent it from scratch. Why? Because the current car is designed around the driver, whereas an autonomous car needs to be designed around the passenger. Autonomous cars 
about traditional cars only go in one direction because we have eyes in the front of our heads. We don't have eyes in the back of our heads. Current cars only have the front wheels turning unless it's a sports car or a race car, but typically cars only have the front wheels turning because the suspension of the car would not make it, you know, not be drivable if all four wheels were turning and we would do like these crab style uh, cars. But then if, in a, if a computer is driving the car, um, then all of those um, encumbrances can be removed. Uh, so you have a car that's bi-directional. You can have a car that can laterally go into a parking spot. You can have a car go down a narrow street and then come back out that narrow street instead of having to do a turn. Um, so that's what um, Zoox is doing. So um, Zoox is an excellent example from multiple perspectives. First of all, they're taking a completely vertical approach. So they are doing everything from designing sensors to designing software to designing a completely new vehicle design. They're creating a new operations uh, uh, network for running these vehicles and offering an app for passengers to be able to hail these vehicles. So it's a complete soup to nuts. Yeah, I mean, you basically pull out your phone the same way you say, hey, like, Shine, come pick me up. Where are you? You have a chat interface um, with Zooks. Vehicle will come pick you up. You sit inside the car. You, you put on your music. You change the lighting. You change the interior atmosphere controls, whatever, the, the climate control. Um, and you have a very, very unique experience as a result. So it's not just an Uber with no driver. Um, and they're basically uh, doing this um, by assembling what amounts to basically four companies put together. It's not just like one company trying to do one thing. Um, and given the nascent nature of this technology, in my opinion, this is the way you do it. And this is probably the only company that's doing it this way. They'll have to raise a ton of money uh, to realize this vision, but so far they've been doing really well. Another aspect that's really important to, to touch on here is the nature of the founding team. I like to say that I look for founding teams that have cognitive diversity, uh, meaning that they view the world in different ways and complement one another. So in this picture here, you have the two co-founders. On the left, you have an Australian creative artist uh, who started four uh, design firms um, and had this vision for a autonomous, vehicle-driven, urban environment. Um, and basically tracked down the uh, captain of the Stanford driverless car team who did his PhD in computer vision and sensor fusion and convinced him to partner up with him uh, to start Zoo. So you have this technical genius who is known um, as, a, you know, as a god in his field and can attract great technical talent and you have this creative guy who can attract excellent creative talent and together uh, create a, a once in a generation company. And so not all of my companies have that kind of uh, profile, but those who, that, who have uh, have done very well. In the case of Nirvana, you had a neuroscientist uh, coupled with a PhD electrical engineer uh, who made chips that, that mimic the brain. And that's why Intel decided to get them, so, to buy them. So that's, um, that's, that's autonomous cars. Any, any questions on this topic? Well, uh, it's more of a general question. Sure. Like, uh, just this topic. Um, one of the main qu main questions is always, um, is the market ready for this kind of technology? Um, right now, a lot of people are asking what happens to jobs, what happens to people's jobs, and uh, how much of the how much of your focus is on when you're doing your research, and how much do you fo focus on that part of? So this is, this is not just related to autonomous cars, this is automation, because we do a lot in automation, robotics. So the question is, how do we feel or how do we look at uh, the possibility of, of annihilating jobs when we're making investments in, in robotics and automation? We're invested in a company called Visor, which is automating the process of tax preparation. So what happens to all the tax repairs? Uh, we have a company that's automating machine shops, so what happens to all the guys that that you know um, handle uh, these tools that, that use these tools. What happens to the drivers when you have this autonomous car company? And so the truth is that yes, you are destroying jobs. But if you zoom, if you zoom back uh, from a macro perspective, if you look at economies um, that have adopted technology, that have adopted uh, automation, and compare those with uh, with economies that have not, you'll see that companies like you know name your underdeveloped country, which has not adopted technology and automation typically has more uh, uh, unemployed people. And if you look at the economies that have uh, adopted automation, have adopted technology, typically have less 
uh, unemployment. So that's the kind of high level macro view. So the question is, well, what happens to people whose jobs um, are destroyed as a result? And I think that's where education comes in. In my opinion, our educational system is, is screwed up. I don't believe in the notion of, uh, it just doesn't make sense to me why you should spend the first you know, 25, 30 years of your life, depending on what you're doing, getting educated in something, or, or getting tools that will be obsolete probably you know, single digit years after you graduate and you're laden with debt uh, for the first 10, 15 years of your career uh, because of that. So I think our educational system has to change um, as we adopt more and more technology so long as we are constantly being trained um, as technology changes and we don't have people that are unfortunately disenfranchised as a result of their, their jobs being automated and then this younger generation being prepared uh, to take over the new jobs, to do the new jobs that are created as a result. I think that needs to change. Does that answer your question? Yes. Question? Uh, just uh, what are your perspective on the regulation side of it? So, and uh, like, uh, not everyone wants to adopt that, uh, let alone the regulation and then the conflict between like self driving car and like, yeah. uh, the cars with drivers. Uh, have you done any lobbying or thinking? Well, I, I don't know how to lobby, otherwise I wouldn't, I wouldn't be standing here and yeah, I'd be on top a little. But I, you know, so so I think there is a, um, I, I think there is a, a, um, a there's a there's a codependence in my opinion as it relates to this. So for most, for for many kind of automation robotics uh, topics, it's very one-sided. It's the technologists trying to push regulators to to adopt the regulation. But I think automotive is unique. Um, because regulators know that, you know, tens of thousands of people get injured and killed in accidents, auto-related accidents, every year. There's these crazy statistics out there that, like, more people died in car accidents than they did in Vietnam, you know, whatever year. So, like, like it's pretty crazy, and everybody's aware of this. So, uh, the regulators feel it incumbent upon themselves to do something about this. And automation is one way. Um, in fact, many people view it as the way to make our roads uh, safer. So the question isn't like, should we adopt autonomous cars for regulators? The question is when. When do we know that autonomous cars are safer than humans? Well, well, luckily, um, humans set the bar very low, right? So, so they don't have. They have to be good, but they don't have to be that good to be better than me. Um, not that I've killed people, but you know, statistically. Anyway, so, uh, so, and that's a very difficult question. I think that's the the. the the hundred billion dollar question, in my opinion, is that when do you know when autonomous cars are indeed safer uh, than human drivers? And the Rand Institute did like this study where they they calculated how many miles a car needs to be driven until you absolutely know for a fact that that AI is safer than a than a human. And the number came out to like you know four billion miles or some ridiculous number. And so the question is, well, then how many people need to die until you actually feel confident uh, that the car is safer? And I think some of that really needs a change in attitude towards consumer products. Right now, when we buy a consumer product, there has to be a guarantee that it's safe. When you buy an iPhone, you know that it's not going to explode um, in your pocket, right? But then, with, with autonomous cars, we know that these autonomous cars are going to kill people. They're gonna be running over, running over kids and dogs, and like, you know, that's something that we have to accept. So will we as a society accept imperfect autonomous cars knowing that less people are going to be killed? And so, and the same is going to go for the robotic assistants and whatnot, you know, like, let's say robotic doctors, like right now doctors cause a lot of deaths, you know, in our healthcare system. So when are we going to accept computers treating us, knowing that computers are also going to screw up at some point. But right now we are, we are more tolerant to people screwing up than we are technology screwing up. And so I think over time we're going to learn how to choose, to be able to better measure technology versus humans knowing that both will make mistakes and, uh, and, and regulators will come up with, well I guess after this cultural shift, then regulators will be more comfortable um, allowing you know, technology to take over human tasks. Again, knowing that the technology could also be imperfect. Um, knowing that as a result, people will be saved through the adoption of that technology. So um, to be more specific, there are a lot of laws that are being put in place that are promoting autonomous cars. In fact, a lot of them were faster than what I was, what I was expecting. So in Europe, you have laws that are allowing for uh, pseudo-autonomous cars, so people can take their hands off the wheel and like the Tesla and not be alert all the time, I guess, but so long as they're sitting, sitting behind the wheel. 
So I think we'll see uh, regulation sooner than you think. But that regulation is absolutely required for companies like Zooks to get into business. Question in the back. Yeah, if entrepreneurs want to contact your firm, should they contact directly or through a third party introduction? So that's a good question. I mean, I get, I get many cold emails. And um, if you're sending a cold email, make sure that the first three or four words in your email resonate. Um, uh, with, with that individual person, because otherwise you just get buried uh, in the noise. Um, but a more effective way to get in front of an investor is to either, if, if, you, if you don't know them, um, to say, hey, like, here's what I'm doing, here's why I think you'll be interested in like one sentence. And um, but preferably if you can find a way to that investor through someone that the investor has done business with, so the highest signal path for an investor, for a founder to get in front of an investor, is to go through one of their founders. So if you go to one of my founders, like one of these guys says, hey, Shine, like, you better talk to, to Jack. Like, Jack is doing something really interesting. Then, then, I, then I have Jack's, you know, Jack has my full attention, basically, at that point. You know, and then like, you know, lawyers and accountants and like all those people, like, you know, that, that's the signal starts coming down. Other investors, you know, like, you know that, that's when it starts going down. But you can cold email, but make sure in that cold email that the message is very clear and crisp and resonates with the individual investor uh, that you're targeting. Question? Yeah, Mont, uh, what is your vision on like having something like this into the market? So because is it, are you trying to, for example, uh, sell this as a license to the big companies because this kind of thing needs uh, lots of like capital investment infrastructure? Yeah. So. Yeah. So this is not for the faint of heart. I and mean, this company's gonna have to raise like many, many hundreds of millions of dollars to make its first dollar in revenue. Uh, my personal view, as I was saying earlier, is that at this point in time, when the technology and the regulation and everything is very nascent, you have to go vertical. Think about the dot of the computer. Like back in, in the 50s, I'm sure IBM was bending its own metal and printing its own circuit boards and fabbing its own silicon and writing its own operating compilers and writing its own operating systems and writing its own IDEs and design environments and creating its own programming languages and, and hiring its own salespeople, right? And selling to banks or, or the military or whoever. And so I think. For as far as driverless cars are concerned, we're in the same era. So if you were Bill Gates in 1950 and say, hey, you know, buy my, my, my OS, people would have said, huh? Like, like what are we going to do with this? And so I think here, we're at least 10, 15 years away from some kind of a standard where you can create some module or some piece of the software or maps or simulators or communications technology, like, you know, like communications protocols for cars and expect somebody to be able to buy it from you for a good amount of money. I mean, normally, I mean, since the, techno since the technology is so nascent, everything is so tightly integrated um, that like getting, integrating something into this stack probably is now more difficult than just building it from scratch, if that makes sense. But that's, that's my personal view. I may be wrong. I may look like an idiot, like, you know, two, five, two, three years from now, but um, there's a lot of companies, a lot of very smart investors who have the opposite view, which think that, oh no, we can build the software and and build the simulators and the maps and all that and license it to companies like GM and Ford and Daimler and Lyft and Uber and whoever or whoever wants to run a, a fleet of cars. But I personally don't have that view. Question in the back? Yeah, um, like for, for example, when you're deciding on whether investing in the first, second, third phases or whatever, do you on your team have people that have specialties in different areas, like for example, the tech company? They can give advisement on what if they think it's a viable tech or if they're five meds or anything. Is that yeah. how that works? Yeah, I, I like to say that we're, we're, we're jacks of all and masters of none. Uh, so I, I don't think I'm, I'm uh, qualified to look deeply. Yeah, so I did my PhD in electrical engineering. I, I know analog circuit design and MEMS. But if somebody showed me this MEMS accelerometer, I wouldn't know if this thing can be, can be produced, manufactured. And I wouldn't know if the thing would stick after it comes out of the oven. So, like, I mean, I would. I would, but the thing is that we do know people who, who are specialists. So for the domain that I invest in, which is typically hardware, uh, whether it's driverless cars, whether it's space, whether it's human machine interfaces, whether it's computer vision, like I know the very best people in those fields who I can trust um, can tell me, which is where the referrals, so the question was about like where do you, you know, like who do you, like what, what's the high signal 
uh, source of deals if it comes from people like that. So, if, for example, I'm friends with the founder of InventSense. So if he brings me a men's deal, then I feel pretty confident that he, you know, has, has vetted this before bringing, it, uh, bringing this to me. Or if Naveen from Nirvana brings me an AI chip deal, then I'm, I, I feel pretty comfortable that, you know, that, this per that these people are legit. They give the confidence for the, for the investment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But normally, the, again, another secret that isn't, you know, I guess, or I guess uh, that's not talked about, is the fact that, you know, when I first, <laughs> so when I first joined Lux, I was extremely paranoid uh, and, and worried that technologies wouldn't work. Well, guess what? The teams make it work. So, you know, in my, in my 10 years at Lux and having watched 50 plus companies, more, 80 plus companies go through the, the, uh, the process, like the founders, guys like you, you know, make the guys and girls like you make the, te make the technology work at the end. Like it, it's not the technology not working that's the problem, it's people not paying for it that's the problem. So more times than not, you'll find yourself in a situation where you've built the technology, you've popped the champagne and it works, and you know people are actually buying from you, but they don't pay enough, which was my case. Like, you know, like I was, I had a gadget that worked, but people were paying me less than what it cost me to build the things. And so, and then sometimes you actually are able to sell product with margin, but like as a startup, you build up this software and support team that you have to pay, you know, let's say a half a million bucks a month to support but your customers aren't buying enough to generate enough margin for you to cover that. So you're going back to your VCs and say, hey, you know, give us some more money so we can make the next generation product. And, that's, and like, it's this kind of, unfortunately, you can dilute yourself to the point where it doesn't make sense anymore. So a lot of companies fail um, because markets don't adopt or markets don't pay, or even if they do adopt, they don't adopt fast enough. That's, that is the issue with startups that many founders don't appreciate uh, and investors don't appreciate early on, unfortunately. So you guys do your part. It's your customers that, don't, that typically don't do their part. Stranger, that is sure. a little bit behind, so it's quarter to eight. Okay, so I mean, there's not a whole yeah. lot more that I wanted to cover. I can just power through this stuff real fast. So space is another area that I'm interested in. Um, so you know, getting stuff to orbit has gotten really cheap and really easy. Um, as you can see, there's an exponential growth in the number of satellites and, and, and spacecraft that's being launched. Um, another example of a great team that, that we backed at Lux on the top left, it's the team Planet. So another great example of cognitive diversity. You have, a, you have two NASA physicists, a public policy person, um, a bunch of nerds in a garage basically that had this vision of putting cell phone components into satellites and flying them. And you know, when I first met them, again, space tech wasn't cool, and they were saying that we want to open source our satellites and give away the images. And I thought like, how is that a business? But you're like, you guys seem really smart. And so um, we funded them, and now they've launched a constellation of over 150 satellites. They're capturing daily images of every point of the surface of the Earth. And they're selling that to mapping companies, to hedge funds, to agriculture firms, to, um, uh, to insurance companies. So um, it's turned into a really interesting business. Um, and more on kind of Moore's Law on satellites. Another area that's really interesting is the analytics of these signals. So taking these pixels that are captured from these satellites and turning them into signals that are that are that people that are actionable. Um, and so, I mean, the analogy here is the Bloomberg terminal, where um, you know all the all this data is gathered, and decision is made. Decisions are made for the hedge fund managers to be able to buy and sell or short uh, stocks. Uh, and so there's a lot of interesting companies. We're investors in one of them, Orbital Insight, which is taking satellite imagery and drone imagery and turning it into actionable data. And the last one is the brain. Um, so this is a personal passion of mine. Uh, you know, there's a lot of interesting news and, and government-led efforts, the, 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 the um, Obama Brain Initiative, around better understanding the brain and interfacing with it. Um, there's a lot of scientific literature um, around this. And um, it's interesting how brain technology is no longer a medical device. Uh, we saw with the success of the Fitbit People are more in tune to tracking themselves. Uh, they want to, you know, share information about their their health. Um, people are very interested in hitting peak performance, whether it's yoga, whether it's hiking, whether it's uh, 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 other extreme sports. Uh, and so, there's a lot of interesting companies uh, that are doing work in the space. We're investors in Halo Neuroscience, so they have this headset that does really cool brain stimulation that uh, helps you hit your peak performance by increasing mental acuity, so it's kind of like, you know, three cups of coffee, uh, effect-wise. Um, we have another company that 
uh, well, there's other companies out there that are doing kind of brain machine interfaces. So you can kind of, there's one company called Neurable, uh, where you wear a VR headset and then it can also measure brain signals and you can just play a game without um, using any kind of controller or any kind of eye tracking, it's just your thoughts. Um, and there's also interesting stuff in the simulation space, which I won't get into right now. I won't leave time for questions, I guess. And so, um, yeah. That's that's I Five think that's pretty much it. Yeah. Yeah. So if you guys have any questions, I have to jet for the airport in 15 minutes, but you can contact me. That's that's barely legible. So uh, <laughs> at my, my initials SF like San Francisco uh, at Lux.vc. So so drop me a line. Be very concise, and uh, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Question in the back. So these boys that you invested, they didn't have any traction or any revenue. How could you invest? In I've invested in companies, I've committed to investing in companies before there was a company. Uh, so it, see, it's, it's, that's a very interesting question. So, um, you know, it's all about comfort level in this business. So if, if VCs are comfortable with you either because they know you or because they're very excited about a market or because they um, absolutely want to have a bet in a certain space, like for whatever reason, if they're very motivated to do something, then they will do it regardless of, even if you don't have a company, right? They'll say, hey, form a company, like in my case, it's, hey, start a company and I'll fund you. So, like that's one extreme. And the other extreme is, oh, you know, come back when you have revenue, come back when you have a million visitors a day, you know, come back when you have X, Y, and Z. And so that just, when, when you hear that from an investor, the translation of founder's head should be, okay, this person's not comfortable right now. And, well, lucky you, there's a thousand uh, VCs in the, you know, uh, a 10 mile radius from here, or a 20 mile radius, well, I guess San Francisco, but whatever, 50 mile radius from here alone. Uh, and so you have many people to go to until just, you know, it resonates so with at least one. No matter what the stage you are in, just go and try, right? You are eligible for venture dollars from the moment you come up with an idea. You have, to, or even if you don't have an idea, if, 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 from the time you have a resume in your hand, hey, I want to start a company. Oh, here, here's money, start a company. Well, like a lot of people, a lot of fun companies have been funded this way, where people with resumes have shown up. Oh, we, you know, we'll, you did your last, we funded your last company, we made a shit ton of money. Okay, we're going to give you money. Take our money for your next company and like, figure it out. You know, go go on a beach, sit down and figure it out. Uh, so that's one extreme. The other extreme is waiting and waiting and waiting until you're practically pre-IPO. And a lot of VCs specialize in pre-IPO, kind of last private dollar in investing. So you have a lot to choose from, which is great for founders. Question? Yeah, yeah about exit. Um, the, I'm in mergers and acquisitions. I'm doing very large in a day, but I don't mind doing smaller in a day. Um, how do we find out what kind of companies you have in that you can watch, you study, and you can have an understanding of if it meets this, I can bring, I can bring you one. Sure, so the question is, how should people who are, I guess, like, like advisors, M&A advisors, uh, I bring the money also. Yeah, exactly, so, so how do you, uh, yeah, how do you track? And money. Yeah, exactly, so how do you track, and I think, I mean, we, we, we VCs love talking about their shit. Yeah, yeah. So, if a VC isn't talking about something, if I didn't talk about something yeah. here, it's because those people in those slides would kill me uh, <laughs> if, I, if I talked about it. So we love showing off, we love talking, so we love blogging, we love tweeting. Okay. So, you know, look at our websites, follow our Twitters, and you know, and, and you'll get as much information as we can possibly share, because again, we'll get hunted I down. I understand this case uh, very well. Yeah, we'll get hunted down uh, by the founders if we talk too much. And it's, you know, I've been, no, I've been no, slack no. on the wrist before. Don't want it to happen again. Okay. Question in the back. How do you see the future of deep AI? I mean, aren't you worried that in the future human would be obsolete and do you think AI should be regulated? Good question. So are we worried, am I worried about uh, AI? Uh, I, I think, um, you know, folks like Elon and, you know, like they, 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 they worry. Uh, I worry. Uh, if, 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 I mean, I, I do, I am concerned as to whether or not humans really matter anymore uh, once you have general AI. Uh, but I just think it will take many, many years to get there. Uh, I think we're hundreds of years away, frankly. Um, has anybody tried using transcription on, on, on their iPhones? Like, I was trying to do a send an email today when I was driving. 
uh, and it was horrible. So, uh, you know, it, it still doesn't know who Shaheen is. My iPhone doesn't know Shaheen. Like I said Shaheen, I put in Shahib. And so, like, it, it, the phone doesn't know its own owner. So, I, I frankly am not worried. Uh, if the most valuable company on earth doesn't know my name after I've been using Apple products for 15 years, I am not worried about an AI coming in and, and, and obliterating my, my race. I'm, I, I just, I'm, not, I'm not worried. Yeah. Starting from Dragon's Peaks onwards, Nuance, etc., still hasn't gotten there because the device doesn't have enough processing power. You need to go back to the cloud. This is, well, this is it. with going back to the cloud. So this is with infinite, you know, compute power from Apple still. Uh, so, and by the way, speech is one of the prime uses of AI. So am I worried about AI, you know, warlords, AI based like Terminator? Not, 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 yeah, I'm not going to, I don't think my great grandkids are going to have to worry about it. But at some point, yes, they would. And I think humans will have bigger problems, in my opinion, uh, in, in whatever, in 10,000 years than worrying about computers taking over the world. Question. You, you had some investment on deep learning. I'm just wondering, you're not trusting AI that much. How come kind of you're investing in deep Yeah, so the question is if AI, well, I, okay, so if I don't trust AI, why am I investing in AI? I think AI can solve a lot of interesting problems right now, but they're a, a ways away from taking over the world. Like if you look at computing, um, computers back in the 80s um, weren't practical for stuff like this. Right for doing presentations, but they were great uh, for doing payroll, for example, for a big company. Uh, so I think everything has uh, its its place and its utility. And I think the utility of there is a lot of utility for AI. There is money to be made with AI, but it's just not going to uh, annihilate us, in my opinion, anytime soon. But so I don't want you to think that I don't trust AI and I think it's stupid. I do think that AI is overhyped. I think everybody is just putting a dot AI you know, suffix on their companies and their URLs to increase their valuations. Um, I think a very small subset of companies are actually using AI tools for their businesses. And I don't think AI is valuable in itself, um, but I do think there are companies that leverage AI to do unique things that could be valuable. Maybe I'm wrong, so we'll see. Question. This but is the question is about exactly the overhype. So, how do you evaluate the companies and how do you know that this whole AI thing is not overhyped? So, uh, so the question is, how do you, if, if AI, if, if, let's just make it general, in, a, in any hyped space, if, in any space that is overheated, let's just say, like you know, I was I was investing when clean tech was a big deal, you know, green tech was a big deal. Um, and it really comes down to getting to know the team and getting to know the asset, what they're really, really bringing to bear, and the business that they're trying to build. Um, normally, when you're doing diligence on a, on a business, um, these, the, the veneer tends to come off uh, very soon. And so, you know, who's the customer? Why would the customer pay? How is this an interesting business? You will see through all that bullshit um, very soon once you start asking uh, these questions. And so the onus is on the investor and the entrepreneur to make the case as to why this business is interesting and how AI makes it special and, and unique. And if that answer can't be communicated in like two sentences, then it's, it's you know, it's, 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 uh, there's nothing, there's not much there. I can take maybe yeah, five minutes. Maybe I can take one no, more question. No, that's five minutes behind. Oh, okay. Oh. It is, yeah. Okay. It's eight o'clock. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Stay tuned for our November talk. Have a great night.